Hi, this is David Thornburg, President and CEO of the Committee of 70. Welcome to uh, another edition of Studio C70, uh, which is an occasional series of video interviews that we do right to Facebook Live, talking to folks both locally and from around the country about what we can do to strengthen our local democracy. And today will be episode two of the occasional mini series that we seem to be doing on working at the polls. And I'm joined today by Ryan Godfrey. Ryan, welcome. Thank you, David. Great to be here. Ryan has uh, been working the polls for about eight years now, and uh, we're looking forward to a conversation with him about uh, the who, what, why, uh, where, how, <laughs> and what uh, working the polls is all about. So uh, let's dive right into it. Ryan, just kind of start with your, you, you're a software engineer. Uh, by uh, by training, and that's your sort of your day job. Uh, so you you have a, a I suspect an affinity for for numbers and data and process. Absolutely. And forth. But yeah. so talk about what got you uh, what what drew you to the idea of working at the polls. Uh, you live in West Philly. Mm -hmm. How'd that happen? And uh, maybe spool back to your first experience, if you can remember that work in the polls. Sure. Well, I, I first got interested. Uh, I think originally I had a, uh, a friend who ran for a judge of elections in Philadelphia in 2009. And at that point, I was like, oh, this is very interesting. And I uh, thought that was great that he was doing that. Uh, and um, but OK, well, I'd like to do this, too. It was too late for me at that point to have to jump in. But it was something that was kind of in the back of my mind. Uh, and then in the 2012 election, uh, the it got a little bit interesting in Philadelphia. There were some, a few people who did some analysis after uh, the election and uh, came up with the fact that there were, I think, 59 divisions in Philadelphia that cast no votes for Mitt Romney. And I thought, oh, wow, that's pretty interesting. I wonder, you know, what's going on there? And kind of jogged my memory about having this be something I wanted to do in the back of my head. And I thought, okay, well, I'm gonna, uh, I think, do this as well. I'm gonna run for office and see if I can, you know, take some, uh, some of what I know about uh, data and analytics and uh, at the same time, you know, help my community and uh, help my city and uh, do something that, uh, you know, is, is I can kind of put my own uh, stamp of integrity on the outcome of the elections uh, in, in West Philadelphia. Uh, I, I've never actually been, uh, or rarely, uh, been a, a member of a party uh, it's in my adult voting life. So uh, I ran as as an independent with no affiliation, which qualified me to be a, um, a for the minority inspector role, uh, which is um, I think at the time there was only two or three people in the city uh, that were uh, not in a, a formally in a party that had any kind of um, uh, elected office. So that was uh, kind of interesting. I think we're seeing more of that now. It's, it, we're starting to see more, but uh, at the time that was uh, somewhat unique. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then they, you know, I got, I had to knock on doors and get signatures to get on the ballot. That happened and uh, I managed to, to, to be elected in 2013. And so I guess my first election was 2014 and that was uh, a little overwhelming. It's they kind of you do get training, but uh, it's kind of a lot to take in all at once. Even if you're familiar with the, the voting machines um, as a voter, there's not that so much that you know about setting them up, taking them down, and all the procedures that you have to follow uh, in a very brief window in the morning. You know, we're usually uh, starting the polls open at seven, and we're encouraged to be there by six thirty. That's not really a lot of time. Uh, and especially if you've never done it before, it can be kind of overwhelming to get all of this uh, happening uh, and, you know, set up and ready to go to so the voters who are basically, you know, can't wait to get in and vote by seven o'clock are, are ready to do so. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just talk for a second. Uh, when, when you uh, first served in 2014, were you, uh, the other folks on the election board had been there for a while or there yeah. were a bunch of newcomers or... No, uh, the, the judge and the uh, majority inspector had been there for, you know, 20 years or something. Yeah. Uh, so it was definitely a, a long time position. Uh, and there had been kind of a string of minority inspectors uh, that have, had come through since then. Um, so, yeah, it was, uh, they, there were definitely people who knew how to do it. And I was very grateful for that. 
it would be tough going into it without having that uh, that experience to to fall back on for sure. But you felt welcome. You you weren't yes. They didn't make I, I, I guess corner or. <laughs> well, I mean, there is kind of there's a uh, a sense that oh well, who is this guy and. Uh, you know, th th he's kind of on the other side. He's th there's there's a uh, at least cautious adversarial uh, approach to to you know someone who's nominally from a different party uh, in terms of election. But I think we hit it off very quickly, and uh, you know, after an election or two, you know, they were relying on me, and and you know, felt we all kind of felt you know we were we were working toward the same goal, which was great. Yeah. You sort of alluded to this, but this is it's a it's a daunting, maybe even anxiety producing job that you take on, right? Particularly the first time. And sure. it, it said when voters show up at seven o'clock in the morning, they expect you got this down. Right. The, the, <laughs> right? There's no reason like, why. Sorry, go ahead. This Ryan guy, he's got it all figured out. And <laughs> uh, if there's any, you know, glitches, you right. know, what's the problem? We're gonna we're gonna start uh, screaming bloody murder. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's like um, justfully or you know rightfully so. Voters want this process to be very smooth for them and as smooth as possible. And that means this kind of organized chaos for the first half hour, particularly if not everybody is there right at the crack of six thirty. Um, then there's there's just a lot to do very quickly, and and then you know there's a morning rush almost immediately. And you may not actually catch a breath uh, for for two or three hours after that. Yeah, it, it's it's trial by fire, particularly as I said the, the first time around. For sure. How do you, uh, I mean, so you've been doing this steadily. I don't mm -hmm. know if every every election, but every steadily, election. So, mm -hmm. so what do you do? You know, to sort of refresh your knowledge, uh, because it is one of those funny things. You you do it twice a year. It's kind of a right. pop up enterprise. So what, what, what do you do to remind yourself of some of the intricacies of the issues that you're gonna face? Well, the first thing is that there is mandatory training that happens that city provides, which is um, at least something to start the brain remembering this stuff. I would not say it's thorough. I think Kate went into this a little bit yesterday, uh, but it's, it's enough of, to, to give you the idea of, of how the machines work, what the procedure is, uh, how to get this all up and running and then to close it down and then all the stuff in the middle. Um, that's probably, I would say, not sufficient. Um, I, I think you, for me, it, it involves going through the manual to figure out what exactly needs to happen uh, and, you know, kind of just rehashing uh, various scenarios in my head and what happens at that point. Uh, now, I mean, we've had two elections with brand new machines and that means that all of that experience that's been accumulated over 20 years from my, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's just out the window because things are basically totally different now. Uh, and I didn't get training in this last uh, election. Uh, I missed it early on and then they canceled it. Uh, so I was relying a lot on memory about how to set up the machines and, and, and get it to operate from, you know, last fall um, yeah. when, we, uh, when we actually did the election in June. Yeah, I wanna talk, a little uh, in a bit of, about your experience in June, which was, you know, those are, that was an extraordinary election, but yeah. just uh, on uh, interested in your thoughts on what, what are the, what are the most challenging types of questions that voters bring to you when you're uh, sitting behind the table? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would say, first of all, it's just about where, where am I supposed to be? I mean, we, there's always somebody who just doesn't know where they're supposed to vote, or they come in, they say, oh, I, I always vote here. Uh, I can't believe that, you know, you're saying that I'm not in the rolls. And usually it turns out that they don't always vote there and there's some other place that they need to be. Uh, it's very rare that, you know, there's just no record of this person, um, you know, that, if, you know, they're, they're either supposed to vote in another division or they've mo re recently moved or something like that. Uh, in terms of other questions that voters ask, uh, especially with the new machines, there's some confusion about what I need to do. Uh, how do I make this work? How do I get the ballot into the machine? Um, those are, I think, very good questions. We only had two elections and most voters have not been involved in those elections for the most part. They were pretty, I, I mean, they're, they're not the major elections that we're definitely gonna see in November for sure. Um, are you a but, fan of the new machines? Yes and no. Uh, I. 
I was not, I, I was all, yes and no also on being a fan of the old machines. The old machines were um, basically, I mean, it, it was a black box. We can't really know what was going inside uh, the machine. So we can't absolutely 100% verify that the, the person you voted for is you know, actually gonna get a, a vote cast for you. But at the same time, it was, 80s technology and essentially it was a toaster i mean it was not like something you could like uh even if you had access to the innards of it in some way there was not a great way for you to go in and change the logic so that it could you know make 15 percent of the vote go the other direction or something like that it's just not that sophisticated uh that was one thing that i enjoyed learning about you know actually being able to be inside the machines and see what was possible just not really that hackable even though it was a black box Almost like an electronic abacus, huh? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really just a, a number counter and there was nothing you could really do about you know changing that information. The new machines, I love that we have a, a paper ballot uh, to fall back on. I love that we can actually, uh, you know, in the event of a recount, we can go through and literally, you know, uh, read these printed ballots and, uh, and see how an election actually turned out and if that matches what was on, you know, the machine count. Yeah. Uh, I, I have some concerns about the, the barcodes uh, that are getting printed on the machines. Uh, they're, they're, those are basically what's getting counted when it goes into the machine. It's not the name that's on there. In the event of a recount, as I understand it, there would we would be using the names and not those barcodes. But uh, as someone who is, is not come equipped with a barcode scanner at, when they go to the polls, there is still some doubt about whether or not the actual people they voted for uh, are included on on that uh, on that ballot. Yeah, well, you you pointed out uh, a what we thought Committee Seventy was a, a major uh, selling point of of the the new machines. Uh, although there were other ways to accomplish that, which is the paper ballot. Because as right. a wise guy friend of mine said previously, when we wanted to, you know, check. Uh, or double check the accuracy of the results, it was like pushing the equal sign twice on a calculator. Right. It's, it's the same numbers. There's, the inputs are the same. There's not going to change. So at the least, and you know, there's, as you know, been a lot of controversy around these new machines and the bar sure. and the barcode reader is, is a part of that. But, but at least we can rest assured that we now have a, a, a parallel system in place uh, to, to track things. So let's talk about June 2nd. Um, yeah. You, uh, you serves as a poll worker. Uh, mm -hmm. Because of the extraordinary circumstances, the, the law allowed poll workers to work at a, a polling location outside their neighborhood, which right. essentially otherwise you're not permitted uh, to do. So, so just talk about that experience, the, the PPE, the, mm -hmm. I mean, it was it, uh, election for the agents, for the yeah, agents. It I was asked to go to, to South Philly uh, instead of uh, West Philly, where I, I normally am, uh, and work in a, in a high school uh, down there. Uh, and uh, that was, it was interesting. Uh, number one, it wasn't a polling place I was familiar with. I kind of had to figure out even how to get into the high school uh, at 6.30 in the morning. Uh, and then uh, the machines were, uh, to their credit, were, you know, in place. We didn't have to move anything around or move furniture around. We were in a high school gym. Um, I felt the location was as, as good as, as could have been under the circumstances in terms of uh, the safety of being indoors. Um, we, were, we had four tables that were evenly spaced out. Uh, the alphabet was divided into four sections. Uh, and then we had another table kind of in the back where we had sort of common materials. And then uh, there were some volunteers from the city who were set up to help us with uh, getting people PPE. Uh, wearing a mask into uh, into the polling place. Uh, in terms of poll workers, we had PPE for some people. Uh, everybody had masks and gloves. Uh, and for some people, there was enough um, uh, face shields uh, for them to wear as well. Uh, that didn't stretch to everybody, so I didn't get one, but uh, we did have some of those as well. The one thing I think we were short of, I really wish we had more of, was pens. Uh, we had about 10 pens for... Uh, uh, I think about uh, 900 people that went through. Um, so you had a pretty busy day, although I don't know how, how big the space was or how many other workers. Yeah, I mean, we had nine divisions uh, and so all combined together. And I, I think 
we ended up having something like 15% turnout just on on uh, the the in in, in location person. voting there. Yeah. 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 Um, so let, let's let's turn to another piece of this puzzle. Um, you mentioned earlier that you had a little bit of a moment in the sun, uh, kind <laughs> of defusing some of the allegations that were made. I guess in the 2012 presidential election, uh, right. people wondering how it is that uh, there were uh, divisions in Philadelphia that returned no votes for Mitt Romney, and you sort of dived into the numbers on that. Right. We live in a time of uh, of exploding conspiracy theories. There's a conspiracy theory uh, every day about something or other that somebody's trying to spin around the internet. And, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of them, without naming names, a lot of them seem to center around the election process. So you're by now a veteran poll worker. You also are, are fluent with, with numbers and process and so forth. So I'm just mm -hmm. interested in how you react to the conspiracy theories that, that, uh, that float out there. What do you say to your family, friends? How do you help them sort of interpret what might be going on or what might not be going on well uh so one you know it's kind of interesting how things have changed in 2016 it was uh it was the uh the philadelphia democratic machine was going to uh essentially uh cast a lot of extra votes on the machines themselves uh that we use in philadelphia and now it's the the, the conspiracy is uh not about the machines although that may come up as well but the focus right now is on mail-in ballots and how those are so easy to uh, to be, you know, replicated or or duped or 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 so forth. Um, it's it's interesting. Um, my background is is engineering, but specifically about print manufacturing. So I kind of know what goes into uh, you know printing something like a ballot and some of the safeguards that are involved in in those ballots um, and uh, why it just doesn't make sense that that's an easy. Uh, route for for election fraud. I mean, the, the because these are we're dealing with uh, basically different uh, different ballots for every division because of uh, you know local people that are being elected, state representatives and whatnot. Uh, it's extremely difficult to come up with a fraud plan that would be able to uh, work across all of these uh, different locations. Um, it's it very it would be very difficult to do so. You'd have to come up with the right paper to match the ballots. You're gonna to have to come up with uh, barcodes that are going to match all the individual voters and make sure you're only getting the barcodes of the people who are not already voting. Um, it's, there's just no really good way to, to do this efficiently. The efficient way to get an, an election outcome that you want is to uh, uh, you know, convince people to vote for your candidate. Uh, it also happens to be not the illegal way um, it's, it's just, you can, your money spent on, you know, fraud, uh, activities would be much better spent just on, you know, Facebook ads or whatever, uh, to convince people to vote the way you want. It doesn't make a lot of sense to get, you know, in one division, maybe, uh, what, a hundred extra votes. That's not going to matter in a presidential election. Yeah. That's, that's a great point. If you're, people forget that the point of all this is to win an election. Right. So you would think, given limited time and resources and energy, candidates would focus their time on those activities that made the most difference to right. win. <laughs> and, and it's actually true. That, yeah, and, and, you know, we've had some, some issues recently in Philadelphia where uh, there are people who have, uh, you know, been election workers like myself who have, although unlike myself, have... Uh, taking money to uh, to try and uh, you know rig elections in some way, and the elections that they're rigging are very local, extremely like the, the kind of election that a hundred votes might actually make a difference in. It's not a presidential election where there would just be so many people that have to be involved in conspiracy to make it even uh, viable. It just makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah. So let's look ahead to November. Are, I assume you're intending to work the polls. Yes. What, what are you anticipating? I remind folks that there will probably be twice as many voters yeah. uh, in November. We're not sure yet how many are going to vote by mail or vote in person. We're not sure uh, what the COVID-19 situation is going to be. A lot mm -hmm. of uncertainty and anxiety. So what, what are you anticipating? 
I, I think you're right. It's going to be roughly double the volume, maybe with all of the by all of the methods. Maybe twice as many people will vote by mail. I'd love to encourage people to vote by mail. It's it's going to make my life easier on uh, in November. Um, but there's going to be probably twice as many people voting uh, at the polls that day, uh, and uh, that's going to make for a long day. It's going to make for a complicated day. Um, I guess I I would ask people. Number one, make sure you know where you're voting. Uh, if, if you cannot or do not want to uh, vote by mail, uh, just make sure that um, you know where you're gonna be, where you need to be. Make sure you're voting, uh, up, information is up to date, that you're registered. Uh, now is a great time to, to check your registration and make sure it's, it's, uh, it's gonna be uh, available for November. And then, uh, you know, bring, your, bring a mask. Uh, bring uh, your own pen. I'd love everybody uh, out there who's, you, you got to sign stuff and I can give the same pen to a thousand different people, but maybe bring your own and uh, we can, you know, cut down, minimize any of this, uh, this disease transference uh, that we're hoping doesn't happen. BYOP. <laughs> yes, uh, exactly. Let's uh, see if we can uh, get that to, uh, I hesitate to say go viral, but let's see. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. What, I, I am, uh, today is a uh, uh, election worker, poll worker double header. I'm going to be talking to uh, City Commissioner Al Schmidt at four o'clock uh, on many of these topics from mm -hmm. his perspective. Do you have particular requests, advice, uh, uh, what, for the commissioners, what, what, what could they do to make the lives of poll workers and, and voters easier uh, and, and smoother in the fall? Sure, I would say uh, uh, training, number one. I mean, it's, it's, I, I know that's on the top of their lists and, and I don't fault them for uh, kind of the chaos that we got pushed into in the spring, but uh, you know, the training needs to be good we need to have uh, fallback information. So even if, uh, you know, after we get out of the, uh, the mandatory training that happens in person, assuming it does, and I really hope it does, uh, there's gotta be videos online, there's gotta be uh, materials so that we can handle, you know, any potential, uh, anything that comes up, uh, we need to be ready for. Uh, so to the extent that they can provide that information, that's gonna be super helpful. Again, uh, more pens. <laughs> yeah, I'd I'd love to have more of them if we can. Hopefully, that's a relatively uh, small expense, uh, yeah. and and it could go a long way to keeping people healthy. Yeah, and I, I guess the other thing would just be absolutely encouraging people uh, to vote by mail. Uh, we we want to uh, keep as many people as we can safe. Uh, there's a lot of people that are you know poll workers by and large are older and uh, they uh, have. Uh, compromised immune systems in many cases. Not all of them are going to be working, but the ones that are, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of them and scared for them. Yeah. And so as, as you know, the, the fewer people that we actually have voting uh, in person in November, I, I think the better off we'll be as a city. Yeah, terrific. Well, thanks for sharing your thoughts with us. Thanks for serving your city and your, your community. And um, uh, we look forward to uh, uh, maybe talking with you after November 3rd to see, hopefully to celebrate the fact that this was a, uh, a well-run and, and problem-free uh, election. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Great. I, uh, uh, we're, we're doing these, uh, as I said, both to encourage folks to, uh, uh, to think about working the polls. Uh, so thanks for setting the example. It's occurred to me that uh, election workers are kind of the first responders of democracy. You know, this <laughs> I like is, that. This is, uh, this is where it all begins and ends. And it is a job that people take seriously and uh, do their best to fulfill. And Absolutely. I think you, you've demonstrated that. So uh, thanks again and uh, look forward to a great uh, election in the fall and we'll see you soon. Appreciate it. Thank you, David. Good talking to you.